Hi, everyone. Welcome to Welfare States and Migration. How will the pandemic reshape a complex relationship? Uh, I'm Megan Benton. I'm the Research Director for um, MPI's international work and also for MPI Europe. And um, I have to start with our usual housekeeping notes. Um, the first is to contact Lisa if you have any technical problems. She is events at migrationpolicy.org or 202 266 1929 in the US. Um, we won't have a voice QA today, um, as always, but we really encourage you to be engaged and interactive. And if you could put comments into the QA or chat box on the right side of your screen, that would be fantastic. For those of you who are joining by phone, you can still um, be involved. You can email um, questions to events at migrationpolicy.org, or you can get on Twitter, if that's your preference, um, at migrationpolicy or hashtag MPI Discuss, and those questions will find their way to me, and I can pose them as the speakers. Uh, today's event is part of MPI Europe's Integration Futures Working Group. This is a network of integration policymakers and experts and stakeholders that was set up in 2016 um, with the goal of trying to peer around the corner. And you can check out on our website, I think there's a link on your screens, uh, some of the papers that we published under the Integration Futures umbrella. Um, and also, while you're there, there are some recent publications worth looking at about COVID, integration, and labor markets. Um, including a paper by Dimitri, who's speaking today, and one by Liam, who is as well. Um, a couple of points of framing to explain what we're doing with today's event. Um, even before the pandemic, and I should say we had planned to do this event before the pandemic, uh, European, European welfare states were facing um, a structural, if not a kind of existential challenge. So population aging is looming for all member states, uh, albeit at, at different rates, and will put huge pressures on health and social care and public spending and pensions. And immigration is often framed as a kind of demographic silver bullet that will reverse these fortunes. Um, but those of us who work in integration learned that the large influx of newcomers in 2015, many of whom had limited education often struggled to get a foothold on the labor market, especially um, in those high welfare spend countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Scandinavia, where entry levels are relatively high. So many European countries were facing the reality that to reap the demographic and fiscal benefits of many immigrants and refugees required large upfront costs in vocational and language training, in skills and qualification recognition, um, in social orientation and support, um, and, and then the pandemic hit. So COVID has made it has made it hard to maintain intensive integration services in many countries. We're always dealing with a data lag <laughs> on all these things, but most signs point to a really devastating effect on the labour market outcomes of the most recent arrivals. Uh, many were working in precarious or temporary work or sectors that have borne the brunt of the pandemic. And many vulnerable migrants and asylum seekers have fallen through the gaps of, of furlough or fiscal packages that have been brought in um, this year. And of course, the pandemic has unearthed new inequalities. So some of us, many of us on this call, have the ability to work from home, a social network, Others have insecure, unsafe, or crowded housing, jobs that are essential and can't be done remotely. Um, but I think in exposing these gaps, the pandemic has also revealed the importance of a social safety net. It's shown that protecting the vulnerable isn't something we do for humanitarian reasons alone, but because forcing people to work because they're sick, making it tough to get treatment, these are all drivers of viral spread. And I think this understanding of the social costs of leaving people behind has has meant that this year has really been um, um, one of innovation in many European countries. Where you look at expanding access to benefits to asylum seekers, regularization schemes, but also rethinking the way that integration programs are, are delivered in a socially distant digital age. So we're going to reflect on these things um, through the course of this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, what we learned from this year of crisis and innovation, what's going to stick? What might go back to normal and what does the future 
look like. Um, the event is split into two. Um, this is session one. Session one is a conversation between two people who've worked on this topic for decades. So Rita Brockman is perhaps Scandinavia's top welfare and immigration expert, professor of sociology at the University of Oslo. We're so pleased she could join us. She also led uh, two commissions um, of the Norwegian government on the interaction between immigration and the welfare state. And Dimitri Papadimitri, of course, is the uh, co-founder of MPI and MPI Europe, where he remains president emeritus, and he continues to convene our flagship initiative, the Transatlantic Council on Migration. Um, Greta and Dimitri will set the scene for what's happening with European welfare systems in this present moment, reflect on the implications uh, for integration policy and the future. And then we'll have a second panel, so please stay on the line. This is really a, a smorgasbord of different pieces of research on this topic. We're really thrilled to have Jacopo Mazza from the Knowledge Centre on Migration and Demography um, at the European Commission think tank, the Joint Research Centre, and he'll be presenting brand new research on the fiscal and demographic impact of immigration under different scenarios. Next, we'll have our own Liam Patuzzi giving an overview of the latest evidence on labour market integration and how COVID creates challenges and opportunities for migrants and refugees in work and entrepreneurship. Uh, then Martin Roos is the Deputy Director of the Migration Policy Centre at European Inter University Institute and an expert um, on migration and welfare states. He's going to talk about his new research on the role of migration in strengthening the resilience of labour markets and services. And finally, our own Natalia Banalescu Bogdan will talk about the gender implications of the pandemic and how migrant women have been disproportionately affected. So we are going to start with session one. And I would like to pose a question to Dimitri, if I may, to, to kick us off. Um, Dimitri, we find ourselves in a really difficult moment for European economies and societies but there are bright spots on the horizon with, I mean, even more vaccine news today. How do you see the next year looking in terms of the pandemic, economies, labour markets, and European welfare systems? Well, that's, that's all you need from me. That's all right. <laughs> you know, clearly um, the news are full of new information uh, about vaccines. Um, and Everybody will ask for an emergency uh, permission to use these machines, these vaccines, and I imagine that um, they will get that. Um, but it will take uh, at least six to eight months, perhaps longer, before everybody has access to these vaccines. Um, the biggest problem that we have, of course, is that we don't know the real efficacy of these vaccines. Will we need one or two doses? Who is going to get it first? Who is going to be left behind? And my fear is that while people like me with pre-existing conditions and of a certain age group might be near the, the front line in terms of having access to the vaccine, many of the people uh, that we know have bore the brunt of this particular pandemic and its economic and job loss effects are not going to be in the first group or anywhere near the top of those people who get vaccinated. This is sort of a sideways of entering the conversation about the contributions that immigrants and minorities in many of our countries have been making during this terrible last eight or 10 months that all of our countries have, uh, have uh, suffered under. And I think that, and here is where the dark uh, side of me um, sort of comes to, fall to the fore, I think that we are underestimating a lot of the economic and labor market um, problems, effects of this pandemic. I think the economic effects, not only will they be deeper than the rather optimistic news that we have received in the last month or two before this latest phase of the pandemic really hit hard, and those economic effects, I am certain, are going to last much longer than what policymakers, or I should say politicians, and other people who want to think positively about these matters 
are thinking about. I think we're looking for something that will have rather severe economic and jobs effects for the next uh, four years or so. And we have lots of experience that tells us that it takes that long to take at the minimum, at least that long before we can take care of structural unemployment problems that we will face, particularly young workers who hadn't been able to sort of insert themselves into permanent jobs or hadn't been able to get jobs during the pandemic. The economic scarring on, on that is going to be very significant. And older workers, workers over 50 or 55 years old, they are probably not going to be valued by employers for a number of reasons that go beyond this conversation in the same way that perhaps they were before the pandemic. So I expect the jobs effect and the economic effect to be very, very severe and to last a number of years. But I think one of the things that we don't hear much or enough about is the fiscal effects. Um, in the past, you know, six years, six months, for very good reason, governments have been throwing money at people, businesses, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all good. And many governments have already committed not only to continue to support wages and small businesses in particular, but also businesses more generally um, until the end of the year, but as long as it takes. Um, the IMF estimates that essentially about $11 trillion is going to be put into all of this. And this is really a, a rather significant amount of money. I mean, I never heard the word trillion uh, really being used in a regular conversation until the last six months. Uh, billions or several hundreds of billions was, you know, sort of the biggest number that I could think of or that you hear in the conversations um, by governments and, um, and um, intellectuals, et cetera, et cetera. But this is really an enormous, deep fiscal abyss. And to paraphrase, perhaps close, um, you know, uh, close to an actual quote, um, Ms. Georgieva, who is the head of the IMF, in her um, speech to the joint IMF World Bank meetings of only last month, she talked about the long, uneven, and an uncertain ascent out of that abyss. Uh, you know, last time I checked, um, borrowing money at that rate is something that has longer term consequences. Somebody has to repay these things. And we know that mature economies don't grow at a fast enough clip, clip to be able to repay some of these debts. So I worry about the fiscal abyss being underestimated by most analysts and certainly by many governments. Thank you. Can I ask a very quick follow-up before we go to, to Greta? So the problems that you mentioned um, affect lots of different groups. You mentioned older workers, entrance to the labor market, young job seekers. To what extent is this an immigrant integration challenge? And what would your big takeaway, or the, how would you frame the challenge to an integration policymaker? Well, certainly it is essential, I think, for us to really look um, sort of clearly at the issue and realize that immigrants, so, you know, whatever, foreign-born persons and their families, their offspring, okay, have in many countries borne the brunt of this. And it is also equally clear that as we sort of dig our way out from the pandemic, we will continue to rely on immigrants. So it is essential that we continue to thinking about how best to invest with limited resources, but with a lot of effort in immigrants in order for them to be able to help us get out of the hole, as it were. It seems to me that this is a time, starting with whenever the vaccine becomes available, widely available and throughout the world, because it has to, in a sense, be available throughout the world. You know, the Deputy Secretary General of the UN 
talked about sort of the, the vaccine, we needed to vaccinate all people. Otherwise, you could have a boomerang effect whereby all people like us, you know, have access to the vaccine. People like them, in quotes, don't. And as they travel, et cetera, et cetera, they infect more and more of all of us, vaccine or no vaccine. So we can't just think only in terms of protecting ourselves. We have to protect people around the globe. But with regard to the immigrants and other minorities in our societies, this is a time for all hands on deck. We need to really work very hard for everyone to contribute to the best of their abilities. And best of their abilities means that we have to continue to invest in the education and training and all of these other things that we know make for a strong workforce. Because immigrants at the same time are the ones that suffer the most, but also they are also the most resilient people anywhere. Because precisely because they are indeed at the bottom in all of these, you know, labor markets, they are also most able to sort of work and take any jobs that are necessary to do. So I think it is time for us, all of our countries, to be thinking much harder and better about how to incorporate all people who are in our countries in the effort to get out of the fiscal and economic and labor market. Cliff. Thank you. I think this would be a great time to bring in Greta and, and perhaps you could talk a little bit about whether you agree with Dimitri, whether you feel as pessimistic. I'm interested particularly, you've been studying integration welfare states for decades. How does this moment compare to other challenges such as the bump in spontaneous arrivals in 2015, the Great Recession? Do you feel his sense of pessimism and do you think the, the diagnosis is the same? Well, thanks a lot, uh, Megan. Um, I do agree basically with, with the most of the things uh, Dimitri said. Uh, but then, of course, uh, there are national and regional specificities in, in this. And, and the Nordic model uh, stands out in, in, in some ways, uh, at least, as a, um, a, and particularly maybe even the Norwegian welfare model, welfare and labor market model, uh, I would say now, um, considering the, the strong oil economy and the extra resources that, that uh, have been available as compared to many other countries uh, in, in terms of being able to buffer the, the crisis, not only the current crisis, but also the other crises that you are referring to, the, the, the Great Recession and, and uh, also the 2015 uh, crisis. Um, when it comes to, to integration of immigrants, uh, then of course 2015 was a very uh, special uh, crisis in, in many ways. It was a, it was a crisis that, that particularly related to immigration as, as a phenomenon, whereas the two other huge crises are more general uh, in, in, uh, in, in scope. And um, I do think that, I mean, it seems now more or less that there is consensus among experts on, on welfare and, and immigration that um, social investment and, and, the, um, and, and the upgrading of, of skills and, and uh, basic education, et cetera, et cetera, is absolutely necessary to accommodate uh, the crisis. Uh, that has been some sort of um, the, the leading uh, way of thinking for, for quite a while, in, at least in the Scandinavian uh, setting. Uh, this this uh, social investment um, and, and uh, educational uh, focus has been there for quite a while, although uh, it has been re-emphasized uh, particularly uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, and nevertheless, I think it's it's uh, it's a bit sobering uh, in some ways to to remind uh, people that uh, it has only been moderately successful so far. I mean, the, the combined social investment policy and the labor market active labor market uh, policies that, uh, in combination, has been undertaken uh, in 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 Scandinavia and. Um, 
I mean, in Norway, for instance, where we have had these, these uh, extremely strong oil economy for, for decades now, uh, the boom period after the, the turn of the century, even during those, those years, it was not possible to, to um, diminish the gap in employment between immigrants and the, the majority population, which is an indication of some very, very severe structural problems. Uh, deep down in, 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 in the system. So, it, it, it's, so to, to, this was a long answer to your question about uh, being optimistic or pessimistic. I'm, I'm, I'm slightly pessimistic, I must say, for the time being, but that, that's never a good thing to, to, to bring on the table. Uh, so I, I would underline, and I really mean, uh, of course, that um, continuing the educational and, and upskilling line is essential. It's absolutely essential. There, there is, is no viable alternative, particularly not in, in systems uh, based on equal treatment and uh, a universalistic, to a large extent, approach to the welfare state, which means in practice that people have access to basic income security from day one as legal immigrants. Uh, that, that, of course, is, it, it, it uh, represents a very expensive system, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a necessary um, uh, measure to, to, um, to have people I included in, in, in work, which is the most important financial side of the whole thing. Uh, and and um, this, there, is, there is no uh, quick fix to, to, to this uh, huge challenge. Thank you. Thanks. And sorry to come back to you straight away, but perhaps you could just dig a little bit further into the Scandinavian model for those people on the line who are less familiar with it. Um, I think it's such an interesting test case for this current moment. As you say, there's a very strong case for social investment, and yet there are these limitations. Despite you know having tried this for a long time now, the results are still, you know, depending on who you are and what your perspective is, a little underwhelming. Could you just talk a little bit about the friction between um, equal social rights and high wages and generous benefits and, and why that's been a challenge for Scandinavian countries? And then is this getting better or worse? Yeah, it's, it's immediately now important to, to uh, differentiate between different categories of immigrants, of course, because um, uh, now indirectly we've been talking about people that have problems entering uh, the labor market. That is, of course, not the case uh, with um, labor migrants, uh, which uh, currently in Norway and since 2004 um, has been the largest uh, group, I mean, the, the one coming from, from uh, the EU. Since the extension of the EU in 2004 and 2007, uh, this group has been the uh, largest uh, immigrant group to Norway, and it has basically been a, a, uh, a strong uh, enrichment in many ways uh, in terms of, of uh, political economy. Um, but uh, when we're talking about the, the, the categories that have problems, I mean, people with low qualifications, uh, basically uh, people coming in through the humanitarian gate. I mean, there is a sort of a <coughs> excuse me, duality uh, inherent in the Norwegian the Scandinavian welfare model. Um, it is uh, both vulnerable in many ways, but also capable. I, I usually... Uh, say in this, this context that the welfare model is both the problem and the solution. Uh, and um, the problem is that we have a very, um, very um, uh, equalized pay system in many, as again, uh, in a relative sense, as compared to, to other um, economies, which means that even uh, low skilled work is paid uh, very high salaries. <coughs> Excuse me, I just need some water. And this, of course, makes it a barrier for productivity reasons for newcomers with low skills to, to get integrated in, into a productive work. Uh, and th this is really the, the, the baseline of, of uh, the, 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 the problem um, field. 
And uh, then uh, these categories, again, with lots of variation in between groups, that's all that's necessary to say. But nevertheless, I mean, I'm generalizing now, uh, these groups tend to uh, become long-term dependent on, on social benefits. Uh, it's self-reinforcing in, in, in many ways. Uh, therefore, it is absolutely necessary to upskill people and, and to, to, um, to quite often also give basic education uh, to, to make this mismatch less severe. Uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's a systemic necessity, really, to, to, uh, to succeed better in this. Because for, for the time being, the, the, the employment gap is, is, uh, is far too big in, in, in the long run. So it has been concluded in, in many contexts now that it, it is uh, the main task ahead to, to, to cl not to close, that, that's uh, too ambitious, but to reduce this gap. Thank you. Um, this idea of skills mismatch um, is a very interesting one. I'd like to turn to Dimitri now. Um, Dimitri, you, you've warned against people who think that immigration is a, a demographic silver bullet, as I put it in my introduction. You, is that definitely the case? Or if you can solve the skills mismatch problem, can immigration be a much stronger demographic tool than we sometimes um, make it out to be? Uh, yes, let me first sort of uh, say something about uh, uh, Greta's um, fantastic uh, comment. Um, I think we can all agree that we need to do our very best to help immigrants succeed because when they succeed, we all succeed. And of course, the obverse is also true. When they fail, unless you have, you're willing to make these extraordinary investments in their integration and in their social support and equal pay, et cetera, et cetera, that only a place like Norway and perhaps a few number of if, if very few other states can make, both in terms of the political commitment that requires, but particularly in terms of how much money it takes. Um, but it is important that we try as hard as we can, realizing that no one size fits all. Not everybody has the advantages and perhaps some disadvantages that the Scandinavians and Norway actually have in that regard smaller societies, wealthier societies, more committed to equality, to inclusion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When I look to the rest of Europe, particularly the southern part of the Europe, of Europe and the eastern part of Europe, the EU I'm talking about, these things are not really nearly as possible as um, they are in some of the more mature, smaller, more north um, uh, parts of Europe and, of course, Germany. And this, of course, takes us to the issue that we're getting to a point where we need to make sure as we're trying to slowly get out of this hole that we have dug, that the pandemic has dug for, for us, to also be mindful of the fact that not everybody will agree with us on the investments that we need to make with regard to immigrants. So here's the dilemma. You know, you need the immigrants that you have. You need it to help them, help you, help themselves and help you. And at the same time, costs really matter. So um, on the issue of demography and demographics and immigration, it's more complex than it looks. Um, we all know that. Uh, we know that there is a lot of support for more and more immigration by one group that primarily cares about growth in GDP. These are the central bankers. Macroeconomists also seem to like, you know, more immigration. Uh, a lot of academics and writers like immigration because their goals, their objectives, their philosophy is consistent with greater openings, openness, okay, with being, you know, having the ability to actually be part of, you know, the somehow world because they're committed to globalization, et cetera, et cetera. 
and of course advocates want more immigration because they have the luxury of being able to advocate for just a narrow group of people. But it is the government's responsibility to try to actually mediate all of these different interests and come up with things that make sense, the most sense for society. So, migration, good, but it needs to be managed well, and increasingly invest more and more on people. And here is another one of those, you know, sort of uh, um, um, things that could go one way or another. Um, Investing in the people that you have, essential. But what do you do about new immigration? And I think this is one conversation that we're not really having. You know, do you continue to have the same kind of openness whenever that becomes possible to immigration that we had before all of these things happen? And I don't know the answer to that. So the demography thing, you know, has been fairly clear by most people who have looked at it that don't have a particular position going into the conversation. Yes, very helpful. We all know that in some places the new worker pipeline is getting sort of narrower and narrower primarily because of demographics, the aging in particular. And we know that you have to have a lot of money and to make long-term investments in order to have people be, um, you know, more uh, to have a replacement level in terms of fertility. And the Nordic countries and Scandinavian countries and Norway and France, you know, there are some unusual places that actually seem to have conquered this. Um, about two children per, um, um, per family, per women. Okay, and that is extremely important in terms of having a stable growth of the population. Some people say bring more immigrants, but we forget that immigrants will also age, and then they will also put the same pressure on the social safety net throughout their lives, but also when they retire. So you have to be careful about these things because in order for that to happen, you have to continually add more and more immigrants again and again and again. And is there a problem with that? I don't know. What I do know is that governments always have to make sort of tough choices, a Hobson choice of sorts. On the one hand, you do much more immigration, and at the same time, you have to deal with your reaction to it. On the other hand, less immigration, and then you do something. You need to do something else that governments don't particularly like to do, which is, to put it in plain language, longer lives mean longer work lives. So all of these retirement schemes that we have, that somehow are, you know, uh, people retire at some time in the late 60s, will have to increase. 70, 72, 75. Not every worker will be able to do that. You know, if you're working in manual jobs, hard jobs, difficult jobs, maybe your body breaks down by the age of 60 or 65. But most of us around this table, but also most workers more generally, if they want to just continue to contribute and for society and GDP per capita to continue to grow, they're going to have to work harder, longer. That's not an easy thing. This is the difficult choices that governments have to make with regard to migration or immigration, I should say. What is not a choice is investing in the people that you already have in your country. Thank you. Um, I want to turn to Greta to see if she has comments on this. But before that, I just want to let the audience know that we are opening the Q&A. Um, for those of you who don't recall, you can um, use the chat function or the Q&A to the right side of your screen. And I'm um, collecting questions to ask of our, of our two speakers. Um, um, but while you get your questions ready, um, Greta, could you give us an example of how Norway has 
decided on the mix between those different policy levers that Dimitri just outlined. So immigration, investments and people who are here, extending retirement or incentivizing people to have the right number of children. I was really struck when I saw that immigration and young people is one of the main drivers of population growth in Norway. So does that mean that immigration is being used as a demographic tool to good effect? No, that that would <laughs> that would clearly not be uh, anything that uh, any of the last governments would would uh, find what you're saying now. I mean, immigration uh, immigration policy in Norway has not had a demographic uh, motivation basically. Uh, although I mean, it, it, the labor immigration from from the EU has been demand driven. Uh, which is uh, indirectly a demographic uh, issue also, of course. But I mean, the, the, the motivation for policymaking has not been demographic. And I, I fully agree with, with all the analytical points that Dimitri made uh, to that effect. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's not going to solve uh, the, the aging uh, society problems to, to uh, have a, a, a much more liberal uh, immigration uh, policy for, for the same reason, reasons as, as Dimitri um, uh, argued. Um, it's, it, but, but on the other hand, I mean, it, it's, a very, um, it's, it's a baseline of the Scandinavian approach to immigration policy as such from the very beginning, that it is necessary to have a combined approach that you have a regulated uh, inflow. You have, uh, you have to have uh, basically uh, a, a governance of immigration. You have to, to, to at least try. I mean, this is, this is getting more and more difficult. Uh, but it, it's ne necessary to try to control the inflow, uh, both in terms of volume and composition. Uh, this uh, is important in order to to have the capacity to include people productively in the labor market and uh, in society more in general, to, to, to be able to create good citizens of newcomers. <coughs> Sorry about this. <clears throat> uh, so it's, it's a sort of a, a dual approach where you both have to, to, to regulate the inflow and on the other hand, to include, include people on an equal basis. That is so, sort of the, the dynamics that has been there all, all the time. Uh, and then increasingly, since, since the new immigration started in the early uh, 70s in, in our region, a uh, bit earlier in Sweden, then since then, um, it has constantly been or, or continuously been uh, more difficult uh, to control the inflow. As we all know, I mean, for for different reasons, for for convention reasons, uh, for for um, uh, uh, EU uh, reasons. I mean, all the, the three Scandinavian countries today are related in in different ways to the EU structure, which of course is also sort of outsourcing immigration policies in many ways. So this this combined thing has made it very difficult to to abide by this basic principle that it's necessary to regulate the inflow. But nevertheless, it, it, it continues to be important uh, to, to do it as, as, as uh, much as possible in order to handle the immigration, the, the integration uh, challenges in, in the next round. Uh, because, I mean, as we see now with the COVID and, and also as we saw in the two former crises also, um, the importance of uh, an inclusive citizenship policy is, is overwhelming. I mean, it's, uh, now with the COVID, we have added a, another dimension to it also when it comes to the, the, the spread of the virus. I mean, to have uh, included citizens and trusting citizens uh, have become extremely important. I mean, it, it's, it's materialized in ways that, that we, we, we didn't even uh, imagine only a few years back. I mean, the, the, the collectivity of the problem now is, is, is overwhelming. I mean, the interconnectedness, the interdependencies within society, etc. I mean, even, even um, irregular immigrants now uh, have, have, have sort of um, 
uh, visualized this, this, this issue. I mean, if, if irregular immigrants um, will, will um, uh, be exposed to, to the virus, they will be, of course, much more hesitant to register with that problem than, than anyone else. And this becomes a societal problem. As such, I mean it, it, it's uh, it's overwhelming what, what is with what is happening in terms of of this this uh, collective dimension of of uh, the problems right now. So social co social cohesion and and trust citizenship has has uh, got new dimensions through the COVID situation. Thank you. Um, Dimitri, um, I have a question here, which is directly for you, and I have to ask you to answer it a little bit quickly, if you wouldn't mind. This is about um, the COVID-induced working from home phenomenon and how this might affect levels of high-skilled immigration and whether it might uh, mean that destination countries, traditional destination countries, um, reduce their overall share of migration relative to other destinations. Well, you certainly you certainly have answered your own question. <laughs> that was how it was framed. <laughs> I read it. Um, certainly, <coughs> a lot of the higher skilled uh, migration and uh, a lot of the work that higher, truly higher skilled immigrants can do um, can be done just from just about anywhere. Whether this is what it is that will happen two, three, four years from now, I think it is unknown. Some of the things that we have been doing in the last six or eight months, working from home, working from abroad, et cetera, et cetera, will certainly last. But I cannot tell you whether the, you know, the effect is going to be whether a third or 20% or 60% of the people who might have migrated otherwise, particularly programmers, higher level programmers, because as we all know, a lot of programming now is done by robots. You know, a lot of the old jobs that we still have, you know, we still use language that was relevant 10 years ago, but it's not relevant today. But higher level kind of, uh, of uh, jobs in, uh, in AI and programming and all that can be done from just about anywhere. But that assumes the people want to stay where they are. And this is the unknown factor. When people emigrate, highly qualified people emigrate, they just don't emigrate because there's a job in the United States or any European country, Norway, Canada, and all that. They also migrate for all sorts of other reasons, you know, the broader economic and social environment, access to the best, you know, universities around the world. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And of course, an opportunity for their children. So these are complex reasons that go into the immigration decision of highly qualified people. But I answered your question quickly. But I do want to say <laughs> uh, to add something to what uh, Greta said because I agree with her, <laughs> and this is really not a good thing to have to assure <laughs> people <laughs> sort of agree with each other. But I want to emphasize, she said regulated. She said, she didn't quite use the word selective, but I will, okay? And I want to add to that how people come in and what forms of immigration there are. So in addition to regulated, which means legal, orderly, et cetera, et cetera, responding to labor market needs, selective, the ability to choose the immigrants that you need and you want, um, forms of immigration, permanent immigration versus temporary migration. These are all the questions that policymakers will have to start answering sooner rather than later when it comes to new immigration. And of course, this mixed flows, uh, that's not the word that Greta, you know, used, but, you know, we all use the same, roughly the same words. Um, building an immigration system through the side door, if not the back door, simply because people came in and you have responsibilities, you know, under international conventions and under European law and under your own laws. This is really something that policymakers can't 
to really control, not without breaking a lot of glasses. So these are the kinds of things that I would worry about were I to be the policymaker that has to make decisions on these issues. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to give the final word to Greta. If you'd like to respond to any of Dimitri's points, you're welcome to. And I'd also like to throw a question to you that's coming from the audience, which is about how Norway sells the necessity of these investments in integration to their voters. That's, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, it is, uh, I think, um, it is uh, sold to the, 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 the public in, uh, uh, more in, in the humanitarian uh, ways than in systemic ways, although uh, increasingly so also in systemic ways. And, and it's, um, it has happened a lot for the last 10 years in, in that respect. And I think the, the, uh, the knowledge in the, the public on uh, the welfare state and its connection to, to uh, migration uh, has increased tremendously. So it is possible today to argue uh, better when, uh, when the politicians are in a position to argue better on these issues um, than what was the case uh, 10 years ago, roughly speaking. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's sort of a, um, it dep depends on the, on the politicians also, of course, but some politicians would underline the, the sustainability of the welfare model uh, mostly, whereas others would, would um, argue in more uh, in a humanitarian uh, fashion. It depends on, on the, the value system of the parties, of course, and, and so it, it, you have the whole scale. But, the, but I, I do think that the, the, um, uh, the knowledge base in, in the public has, has improved tremendously lately. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for your today. Oh, I think I started speaking while I was muted. I just said thank you so much um, to both of you for your extremely thoughtful remarks. And thank you to the audience for some really terrific questions that came in at the end. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but I'll pass them on to the speakers afterwards. We're now taking a two-minute break, and we're coming back to panel two, so please don't go anywhere. But if you have to, then the uh, video for both sessions will be available on Thursday, and you can check MPI's website in the meantime for related resources. Um, thank you, Greta. Thank you, Dimitri. This has been wonderful. Hi everyone, welcome to session two. I hope that you joined us for session one, but if you didn't, I'm Megan Benton. Uh, I'm the research director for MPI uh, Europe and for MPI's international work. This is part two of Welfare States of Migration, How Will the Pandemic Reshape a Complex Relationship? Um, in part one, we discussed some of the structural challenges that especially Northern European welfare states are facing. We touched on labor market change and population aging and human capital investments. Um, I just have to remind you of housekeeping notes, there's no voice Q&A, but you can use the chat function or the Q&A function to send um, questions to me, or you can write to events at migrationpolicy.org. Um, our four excellent panelists today, we have Jacopo Matza, who is a scientific officer from the Knowledge Centre on Migration and Demography at the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission. Um, our own Liam Bertuzzi is a policy analyst at MPI Europe. Martin Ruth is Chair in Migration Studies and Deputy Director of the Migration Policy Centre um, at EUI. And Natalia Banalescu Bogdan is the Associate Director of the International Programme at MPI. Um, I'm not going to do an intro because I did one last time. Um, but one of the themes um, of the last session was the limitations of seeing immigration as a, a silver bullet. Uh, for demographic change. So I'd love to start with Jacopo to talk about your brand new research um, that maps out different scenarios for immigration and the fiscal impact on European economies, societies, welfare systems. Jacopo. 
Hi, thanks, Megan, and uh, thanks for the invite. Nice invite and give me, to give me the opportunity to uh, present our new report, which was launched uh, last week. And if anyone is interested, it's, a lot, it's uh, available, freely available. And uh, in this report, what we do is, uh, as you mentioned earlier, we are uh, assessing what is, uh, first of all, the fiscal impact, the current fiscal impact of uh, migration in the EU. So in all 27 EU members now, uh, we treat UK in a slightly different manner now, even though it's included. And uh, then, uh, uh, as uh, as we all know, uh, welfare uh, and welfare implication have long-lasting implications. So what we do is we add these accounting exercises. Uh, we add a dynamic aspect in uh, trying to project how this uh, fiscal impact of migration will evolve in the next 20 years. So we uh, basically join two elements, one economic, which is an accounting, uh, where we account current, and then we project this in, uh, in a demographic manner, adding uh, uh, perspective uh, aging of the population and adding perspective labor force participation of the population and of migrants in different flows and uh, perspective flows, different flows of uh, migrant population. So I will be quite brief. I don't have a lot of time, so I will jump to the to the numbers to the meet. And uh, the first thing I would like to show um, to the audience, to everyone uh, for discussion, is uh, uh, the accounting element. So this is the net fiscal position over the life cycle for um, the three populations that we distinguish in our report, which is natives, and with natives obviously we, uh, we refer to uh, EU natives, so people that are born in one of the EU 27 members, actually 28 members, uh, and then extra EU are those uh, people that were born outside of one of the 27 members and now are living in the in the EU, irrespective of their citizenship. And the in, while intra-EU is uh, are those migrants that are born within the uh, the union but are living in another member state. And so this is the the um, uh, life cycle um, contribution of these two of these three groups. And what we can learn here is that. Uh, Clearly, there is a, there is a clear pattern that all three groups respect. They, they basically have the same pattern in which we all are all beneficiaries. Net beneficiaries at the beginning of our life, of course, uh, we are, are using services like education in this period, uh, and then we become net contributors to, to the public purses while we are actively uh, actively working, and uh, this starts dropping quite dramatically when when we retire. So you see that we become very uh, net, everyone becomes a highly net beneficiary after retirement. Uh, and you see that there are also some intra-group differences, of course, here. You see that, the, for example, the blue line here is the natives, and those are the ones that are actually contributing the most during their working lifetime, uh, while the extra EU migrants, which are in green here, are those that are contributing the least. But it is a snapshot, okay? So but what you can, we can learn here is that there are three clear moments. In, in our in the life cycle of, of everyone, and this obviously has implication because this is the life cycle. But of course, the demographic structure of the three population is very different. A lot of the natives are found at the right hand of this curve, while a lot of the extra EU migrants are at the moment found more on the left of this curve, so more on this uh, on on the contributory side. And this has obviously implication because when we are then uh, um, oops, sorry, went the wrong way. Let's go the right way. Uh, when we are um, when we are calculating the average contribution of the average intra U, extra U, native on public purses, then this demographic uh, structure obviously matters a lot. Okay. And so what we are doing here is uh, we are projecting the status quo, so the current uh, status of uh, demographic structure of. Um, uh, skill composition and uh, and of tax uh, of tax structure in the EU, and we project what if nothing changes in these components, and what happens in this net fiscal contribution for the next 20 years. And what we see is that there will be a one clear only one clear net contributors, which is the intra-EU mobile. Uh, population, both extra EU and natives will actually become net beneficiaries of 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 the benefit, the welfare benefit. And then the yellow line tells us what, what if we average this contribution through for the whole population. And of course, you see that this average tells us that in the EU, if nothing changes, well, the average 
citizen, the average, actually not the average citizen, but the average inhabitant of the EU in 2035 will be a net beneficiary. Uh, this is 1,000 euros, net beneficiary of the contribution. And this is why, because, well, if you see, this line of all follows quite closely the line of natives. And that's simply because natives are the, by far the biggest group uh, of, uh, of residents in the, in the Union, and they will keep on being the biggest group, irrespective of any type of migration, the realistic migration scenarios that we have in mind. Uh, now we have around 10% of the population in Europe is not native. Well, the, so you, you can understand that they will be the big drivers of this uh, evolution. So, um, but the, the nice thing is that we don't, we can use our demographic micro simulation model to see what if we change some parameters in this status quo? What if we, for example, and these are the, the scenarios that we simulate, what if, for example, we change the level of migration, the level of flows and uh, the out, inflows and outflows in the EU? What if we change the labor participation of migrants? Uh, or what if we change the selection of migrants, type of selection of migrants? And here we can simulate what happens to that status quo that I just showed you if we are uh, changing something in the parameters. And Okay, so the, the three things that I would like to point your attention to is that if we simply act on the sizes of the flow, these are the high immigration and low immigration scenario down there, you see that the difference these are different. You have to interpret this graph as differences with respect to the status quo that I showed you earlier. So the differences are not very high. In fact, uh, the net contribution of uh, third country national or third country born migrants in the, in the Union will not change much uh, if we change just the, the level of, of migration. What will actually matter a lot if we start to promote their participation in the labor market. So here, this is the scenario, equal labor intensity we have, uh, we have marked it. Uh, and that scenario basically uh, tells us what happens if migrants, if the labor force participation of migrants converges to the labor force participation of natives. And you see that, 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 that the change is quite dramatic. You can, we, uh, the average uh, third country uh, national would actually, its contribution would increase by 1,000 euros uh, per year. And then, of course, the situation would even improve even further if we were able to uh, implement some uh, uh, some selection of uh, the migration flows according, for example, to the Canadian type of, uh, of migration, then the, the, their contribution would even increase even further because we would be attracting even more high-skilled migrants. So what is this, uh, and I'm basically concluding here, what is this, uh, our analysis overall saying is that, um, well, if we are concerned with whether migration can help uh, the sustainability of welfare states in Europe, uh, our analysis shows that it can help, for sure. It can help, especially if you're able to promote uh, active uh, labor market policies. Uh, so if you're able to promote uh, the participation of migrants in the labor market, or if you're able to attract diff a different composition of migrants. But if you're just hoping that by um, increasing the flow of migrants into, into the union, and but nothing else changes, uh, around that, then migration will actually not uh, help quite as much as we would hope to uh, the sustainability of our welfare state. Why? Because, well, because the natives are actually draining a lot of resources already, so something will have to change in, the, in, that, uh, in that respect. Uh, but, and if you are interested, this is the, this is the report, this is the nice cover page, and this is where you can find our report. And one caveat, I have to say that all of our projection, all our number were produced before the COVID shock. So we are not really, we can't really say where, how the COVID shocks would impact. My hunch is that there will be, of course, an effect. Uh, we will have a different, possibly a different composition. Possibly we have, we are experiencing now some scaring effect on the current population that is in the union. Uh, we, we saw the job separation for migrants are actually higher than for natives. So that will, will, come to play. So, but we haven't studied it there. We don't have the data yet doing that. So it would be interesting, in my opinion, to see what happens in the future up by updating our, our estimates with uh, with that are including in some in some way the, the COVID shots. And uh, I'm done. With my presentation. I'm definitely going to get into trouble for um, running over time. But I'm just really dying to ask you 
One other question about how your assumptions would have changed if you had done this after COVID. You have this interesting finding about intra-EU migrants having such a different impact, but intra-EU migration has been all but grounded this year, and many of the sectors that um, mobile EU citizens work in have been decimated by COVID. So would that also have changed your assumptions, do you think? Uh, well, more than our assumption, well, of course, uh, it would have changed our results. My opinion is, uh, is that uh, I, I believe, yeah, for sure that we, we are seeing some impacts in flows, and we're seeing that it's particularly detrimental because we saw that the intra-EU migrants are such high contributors, and uh, by we are subtracting some some share of those of that population to the to, to the total number. So for sure that would have had some effect on the on the on the intercept, on the total contribution. The, the individual contribution uh that would have had an effect as well in my opinion because as you as you mentioned the, uh, a lot of the sectors where inter EU migrants are employed they are actually hardly hit hard by the by the COVID crisis. So that would cause some uh, unemployment, so involuntary unemployment among the, the migrants, intra-EU migrants and extra-EU migrants in, in general. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute, unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jacopo. And I think that's a nice segue, that last point, uh, to, to Liam. Liam, could you tell us a little bit about how the pandemic has disrupted labor market outcomes for immigrants, um, how it's thrown a spanner in the works? Sure. Thank you, Megan, for introducing me. Um, so, yeah, actually, I would like to maybe try to use my uh, short slot to provide some reflections on uh, or to attend some reflections on how um, welfare states, as welfare states evolve under the pressure of the current crisis, what the what the um, consequences might be for the space available for integration policy. And, of course, also relating to the to the question that you just asked. So I think we heard a lot already about the vulnerabilities of migrants in societies and economies affected by COVID at the moment. So I'm not going to repeat all of those, but in the frame of our research and of our Integration Futures project, we also tried to explore based on probable medium and long-term trends on the labor markets, uh, what the consequences could be for migrant workers. And if we look at these likely trends, namely of growth on digitization and automation, as well as an increase in um, atypical and precarious work and the destruction of jobs in some sectors, while, of course, new jobs also rise uh, in new sectors, but as Dimitri mentioned, it's going to take a while. Um, migrants and refugees are more likely to fall through the cracks of this uh, transitional phase. Um, and this is for several reasons. They work in jobs that uh, cannot be performed remotely to a higher extent. They um, often, due to the you know, digital divide and, and linked to many reasons, they often lack digital literacy to a, to a higher extent. Um, they struggle more in education systems and also they, they face obstacles in accessing further training. So. Um, very recently, we had this interesting collaboration with uh, welfare scholar uh, Anton Hemmerreich, also from EUI, and we explored, we discussed what the type of welfare state could could be that offers the key for European societies and economies to, to protect their populations during the COVID crisis and also to, to prepare the ground for economic recovery. And this, as has already been mentioned also by Grete, uh, the social investment welfare state, um, although, of course, it is also linked to certain doubts on, on how this has performed, but uh, this is a, a type of welfare state, the, the social investment type, that basically does more than providing just safety nets. Uh, it gives uh, individuals and families to the tools to prevent falling through the gaps, uh, for instance, through lifelong investments in human capital. And interestingly, what we realize is that much of this investment logic is also at the very core of the evolution of integration policy of the past few years. So especially in the phase after 2015 and 16, which had a lot of experimentation. Um, this phase promoted, for instance, a stronger understanding um, that integration is a process where early stage investments have long-term consequences down the road, whether 
positive or negative, depending on, on the investments, of course. And some of these approaches that were very visible after 2015, for example, um, kicking off integration pathways and investments as early as possible. Um, some countries have reduced the time of employment bans for asylum seekers, for example, or they have improved their systems for skills assessment and recognition. Another principle was to give migrants and refugees those skills that uh, are most likely to yield um, you know, durable long-term results in terms of autonomy and career progression. For instance, entrepreneurial skills, which of course in our labor markets nowadays are not only important to set up a business, but also just for general employability in the, in the gig economy. And so this investment approach may be now more needed than ever, as the present disruption, of course, risks reinforcing inequalities, and yet the space of integration policy is challenged from many directions. Um, on one hand, there is the economic uh, recession and therefore, you know, the specter of austerity, um, widespread social needs, and so there is some calling into question investments for some target groups specifically. And then there is this political volatility and the risk of anti-immigrant sentiment, of course, in a situation that is volatile uh, and uncertain. And so how to protect this space for integration policy? Well, one reflection that um, I would suggest here, and of course also up for question and debate, is to mainstream the lessons of integration policy. And this means basically to incorporate them into generic welfare services. However, this mainstreaming process, as much research has already found, is very tricky and quite risky. Um, it can only work if governments really address the barriers that migrants and refugees face in accessing public services. These are not just uh, formal barriers, such as eligibility criteria to accessing some benefits, but also, um, you know, Migrants and refugees, for example, tend to have a low participation, participation rates in lifelong learning and adult education. And this is often due to how these systems are designed and who, to, who they are accessible to, and namely, currently, often uh, primarily to workers in stable and full-time employment. So, yeah, if these barriers are not addressed, then any attempt of mainstreaming will simply uh, consist of cuts in integration funding, and, and this is, of course, the risk that we uh, need to keep in mind. I think, um, yeah, for time reasons, I'd rather stop there for now, and then, of course, i um, happy to discuss anything else um, later on in Q&A. Thank you, Liam. Thanks for that really comprehensive overview of different policy levers that can help at this current moment. Um, and you're right, we need to stop talking about the social safety net. I was wondering whether social safety trampoline or something might be more appropriate. Um, anyway, thank you. Um, I want to turn now to Martin Bruce. Martin, you have written um, about how the pandemic has illuminated the high share of migrants doing essential work and how this might be a source of resilience um, as we look to the, the economic recovery. Could you talk a little bit um, about your work and about the future? Yeah, thank you, Megan, Lim, and MPI for inviting me to join this interesting discussion. Um, so the title of this session is Welfare States and Migration, How Will the Pandemic Reshape a Complex Relationship? And um, of course, there's been a lot of debates and research on the relationship between migration and welfare states. And in, in terms of implications for policymaking, what we see is that there is a concern about the compatibility of large-scale immigration welfare states, and as a result, we often have restrictions on migrants' access to certain sort of rights, at least to those restrictions on the rights of, of new migrants. So I suppose when I look at this question, you know, is there going to be reshaping? Well, I think that obviously depends on, on whether anything big is changing during the because of the pandemic. Of course, the pandemic is a big event. There are big economic consequences. But are any fundamental considerations changing? Any fundamental considerations that we have previously um, thought about when we think about immigration welfare? And as Megan said, I think one, one issue that I argue has changed um, is that there is now much more talk than before about what I would call the systemic resilience. 
of the economies and societies, and more simply put, it's the resilience of essential services uh, to major external shocks, such as the pandemic. So I'm talking about uh, food and agriculture, um, health services, social care. So how resilient are these essential goods and services to the pandemic uh, and also to future similar shocks? And by resilience, I simply mean the ability to withstand, recover, and adapt to, to, such, a, to such a shock. Uh, I think this is a somewhat new consideration in the past when we talk about the impacts of migration. We typically talk about economic efficiency, so economically other benefits or costs. And then, of course, we talk about distribution in terms of who benefits and who loses. That's how the debates are framed. But now I think if we take this issue of resilience as an systemic resilience, so the resilience of essential services, if that is a real serious additional policy goal, I do think that raises quite a few questions about how we think about the impacts of migration and also about the design of, of, migration, of my migration policies. So just focusing and again on migration and welfare states. So typically, uh, the, the concern that many people have um, are kind of twofold. There could be of two types. And one, there's obviously a big uh, de uh, debate about the kind of fiscal effects of, of immigration. What are the fiscal costs and benefits? And as Jacobo just presented, there's different types of research um, that try to uh, calculate what are the costs and, and, and what are the benefits. And, and because of that calculation, there are certain uh, policy implications follow. For example, that typically on uh, migrants in lower wage jobs, you have more restrictions on their um, access to welfare states because it is concluded that, that creates, they create more fiscal costs than those earning higher wages. Um, but then there's also different types of argument, which really has nothing to do with actual costs and benefits, but it's more kind of additional, which is um, about the deservingness of particular groups uh, including migrants to, to welfare benefits. So there the idea is that, for example, should people who, who are newcomers to our country, should they have access, equal access to welfare benefits? And so that could be a reason. If you think that people should kind of work their way up and they do not have the same rights as those who, people who have been here already, then there should be some restrictions. There are different types of, of reasons that people give for restricting access. So when you think about resilience, I think, systemic resilience, those kinds of dynamics may change. So, I mean, if you start including the role or the potential role, the impact that migrants have on providing essential services, positive or potentially also negative in some cases, I think the, the fiscal cost and benefit calculations could, could change. And typically that is not done. I mean, the contributions that migrant may, migrants make to providing public services is not typically considered in fiscal impact exercises. Similarly, I think the way people think about the deservingness of, of migrants <clears throat> may change uh, because of this concern with resilience. So we've seen in many countries, for example, people coming out and people clapping for essential workers and, and, and an apparent revaluation, appreciation of many migrants in essential services, including those in, in lower skilled jobs, uh, those that you know, typically would uh, not be a priority of, of proactive immigration policy making. So it's an interesting question, I think, is for example, whether public attitudes may change towards some migrants in lower skill jobs in some of these essential services. So I think both on the material impacts and on the more additional impacts, if you think about systemic resilience, uh, things may, may change. I mean, it's an, it's an open question. So, I mean, this is why um, I've gotten interested in this, and at the Migration Policy Center and the University of Bristol, we've started this new initiative that basically looks at the impact of migrants on systemic resilience, focusing on food and agriculture, social care and health services. And we basically are arguing that this is a new question in a sense, and we really need some systematic research on this. Uh, obviously, migration and migrants, migration policy are not the only factor that affect resilience. There are lots of other institutional factors that are important, but we really, we really need to think about this much more systematically that, than we have done before. And, and once we have that knowledge, I think there are some serious questions for policymaking. So what does that mean for policymaking 
Um, should there be strategic policy making, a bit like industrial policy, where you pick specific sectors that get preferential treatment in terms of migration policy because we see a specific value in supporting that sector through migration? Or do we think that the availability of migrants might have adverse impact on resilience to particular types of shocks? So, so I'm not presenting your research, but these are just some ideas. And if you're interested, I would encourage everybody to look at the website of the Migrants and Systemic Resilience Hub at the NPC. I'll also post it in the chat here. But thanks again for having me. Thank you, Martin. That's such an interesting point, how we need to look beyond economic value and how the pandemic has shown that you can't really weigh the importance of different types of work with a fiscal ledger. Um, one thing that I'd like to come back to you after, Natalia, is, is also the question of how we value childcare, I think, which is another form of work which has proved essential um, during the pandemic. So, it's a nice segue to, to Natalia's intervention. And, and, Natalia, we joked a little bit that putting you at the end was a bit like the and women um, at the end of a panel. But I think that the gender impacts of this pandemic are anything but afterthoughts, you know, it's really reshaping the distribution of, of domestic work. So perhaps you could uh, just talk a little bit about that, and then it would be great to him whether Martin's fitting that into his resilience framework. Megan, um, so it's been interesting as we've gone through this discussion, you know, one thing we've heard over and over is that integrating workers who have trouble accessing the labor market is one of the most important contributions we can make. But of course, integrating low-skilled immigrants and, and you know, women in particular has remained a, a really vexing problem um, in a lot of our countries. We know some of the reasons. There are, there are structural and individual barriers. Um, it's difficult to get a, a foothold into labor markets that has few entry-level or low-wage jobs. Women face a double disadvantage with childcare obligations. But we're also looking at some policy barriers. Um, in some countries, the generous family leave policies that have been put in place to help parents, thinking of you know, Finland's cash for care subsidy, can actually tilt the balance toward women choosing to stay at home instead of opting for things like public daycare that could allow them to try to work. Um, there's also the way that family leave is distributed. So even if paternity leave is theoretically available, there often isn't a specific financial incentive for men to take it, um, though there is in Sweden, uh, which means that, that gender roles will remain rigid unless this is really thought through. Um, you know, European countries have obviously tried to adapt in numerous ways. Um, you know, Germany is trying to increase the supply of full day subsidized childcare. Um, some countries are making eligibility for parental leave contingent on employment, like in France. Uh, but then, of course, we have the pandemic, which has layered itself on top of all of these existing barriers. So it makes the entry into work itself a kind of harder mountain to climb, but it also threatens to erode the progress that we've already made. Um, so we've talked already about how the, this period of economic lockdown has really been catastrophic for sectors in which women are overrepresented, um, you know, retail, hospitality, tourism. But it's also been catastrophic for women on the brink of life cycle transitions. Um, so mothers who were thinking about rejoining the workforce or had newly entered were really set back by these large scale school and daycare closures. And again, with childcare responsibilities falling very unevenly on women. Um, we also have to think about the peculiarity of this specific crisis with an infectious disease epidemic, unlike a purely economic crisis. You know, you can't rely on grandparents um, to fill in these informal childcare gaps. Um, one of the one of the silver linings of um, of this period that's often cited is is we're entering this period of you know creative use of digital tools. Um, and I'll, and I'll end on this point, um, but it's important to note that this digitization will have very uneven effects. So it addresses some of the access barriers that we've discussed, but it also creates new ones. Um, so we've seen, you know, as in-person um, integration and language courses have shut down, 
these online equivalents pop up, um, which may be very good for advanced learners, but are not actually going to help those most in need. So very beginning language learners, those with low literacy. So on one hand, you know, for women for whom the primary barrier um, was lack of time or transportation, um, digitization may help solve some of these problems. So in Sweden, for instance, we heard that many more women have applied for fast track services permits once the process went virtual um, and traveling to a physical office was no longer necessary. But for women for whom the primary barrier is cultural or is, or is a literacy barrier, um, this trans transition to the virtual sphere might actually exacerbate inequality. Um, we have to think about being cut off from lots of different access points to information, um, lack of access to smartphones or computers, or these things filtered through uh, their husbands. Um, so, you know, we're also facing a situation where we're seeing problems of social isolation and exclusion really being aggravated. You know, being trapped at home can leave women susceptible to gender-based violence. It can reinforce stereotypes about culturally distanced populations living apart. Um, and of course, it also makes it that much more difficult to regain a foothold in the labor market later on. So the questions that, um, just to conclude, that, we're, that we've been asking about, you know, will this crisis kind of wipe out some of the progress that we've seen on integration outcomes for migrant women? Um, you know, there's still a lot we don't know about the duration and severity of the economic crisis. Um, and what we see is the disproportionate effects on women now might even out as we begin to see some of the supply, supply chain effects of the downturn affect male dominated sectors like construction. But I think what we do know is that the, the twin effects of, of severe job losses and the erosion of community based supports that women rely on is something that really needs proactive investment. So as we consider uh, the economic recovery, I think we also need to pay attention to rebuilding the, the social infrastructure. Thank you so much, Natalia, for those really interesting and helpful comments. Um, uh, the floor is open for questions from the audience, as I'm sure you all know, that's Q&A or put something in the chat box or email events at migrationpolicy.org. I already have a great question to pose to Jacopo. Um, but first of all, it starts with congratulations for a good report. So I just wanted to pass that on too. Um, uh, but there are many difficult hypotheses made in the report, including about migrants staying to spend retirement in their host countries. What do we really know about this? Uh, yes, thanks for the question. And thanks for uh, thanks to Laurent, uh, who I know quite well, who's a uh, full university. Um, he's right. Of course, this, this uh, the, the, was very challenging as a project. Of course, you can imagine that we had to uh, come up with a lot of uh, assumption and simplification to a certain extent of dynamics uh, and of accounting uh, to, to come up with, with our estimates. And one of the assumptions is that um, migrants stay on uh, un until basically the, the end of their life in their host country. Obviously, there is some uh, outflow, but that outflow is not necessarily uh, very different from what is the outflow that we observe uh, from for natives uh, or intra-EU migrants. And then you simplify an assumption, and of course there's some consequences, because if we are imagining that, uh, we, as, we, as I showed you earlier, the, the, the period of life in which you are the highest net uh, recipient uh, is in after retirement. So what we are basically saying is that if migrants have the same, uh, have the same uh, probability of staying as natives, we're possibly overstating uh, um, the drain, the fiscal drain that they have. On the, on the fiscal purse, because you can imagine that um, migrants have a tendency of going back to, to their original countries once they once they retire, or not necessarily, but I, of course, the, the, the big chunk of them will do that. Uh, and why we're assuming that they stay, so we're also assuming uh, that they are uh, collecting all the pension checks that they are entitled to, which might not be the case, because we know, for example, that in a lot of uh, uh, 
pension schemes, you need, for example, to have worked a certain amount of uh, years in the country to be uh, eligible for uh, for collecting pension checks. For example, Italy is one of these countries. You have to have worked a certain amount of time. And we know that, for example, uh, a lot of uh, temporary workers or a lot of uh, seasonal workers will not be entitled to, to pensions. So, to a certain extent, in that uh, regard, we are overestimating their fiscal drain, but on the other hand, we are also uh, overestimating their fiscal expenditures because we are accounting for, for example, if you think someone who stays in the country will also spend the money in the country, that will be subject to taxation, so it's, for example, to VAT taxation. Uh, and by assuming that they stay in the hosting country, we are also or inflating uh, the VAT taxation that they will be paying once they retire. So th there is this effect. It's very hard to disentangle because of uh, well because of lack of data. We, we, ideally, what we would want to have is uh, a panel data that covers the whole ca the whole continent and has enough migrants in it that we could actually observe the transition. We can observe the probabilities of transition, the, out the outflow and the inflow. Unfortunately, that is not available, to my knowledge, that is not available uh, for the EU as a whole. So we had to come up with this, uh, with this assumption. Whether we are over inflating or deflating uh, the, the fiscal drain of, my of extra EU migrants, that's probably, I would say that we are uh, inflating the fiscal drain, so we are deflating the fiscal contribution. That's the other side of the coin, because probably the side of the, 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 the assumption that they received a full pension, it's uh, it's over or it's beating the, the assumption of paying the full of VAT in the host country. Um, but it's hard to come with the, the precise estimate of that. Thank you so much, Jacopo. Um, and um, Martin, I already previewed the question that I wanted to ask you. Um, parents, usually women's adaptability uh, during the pandemic has been really vital um, uh, to step in to, to substitute for school closures, et cetera. Is that part of your systemic resilience framework and how do you kind of measure social value of, of of, of care responsibilities. That's a great point. I think it certainly should be part of the thinking, I think, because one thing that the pandemic does is I think it makes us think, it makes us realize and think about, um, you know, what we value in our society and to what extent what we value um, is actually paid for also and, and appreciated, not only socially appreciated, but also um, uh, paid for. So, as you mentioned, um, there's so much unpa unpaid work that is done in the household uh, by women, uh, uh, by men, um, that is absolutely vital during the pandemic, but that is not typically um, uh, paid for and that does not get the recognition generally. Um, that we can expand more broadly to care work. In, in many countries, people say care is very important, but in practice, social care systems are undervalued, not very well financed, um, and so on. So, so I do think that the thinking about resilience, I think, is an opportunity to make the kinds of connections between migration and other issue areas that, that a lot of us have, have long said should be made, but that haven't been made. But now we are being forced to make them because now we are being forced to think about, okay, so, you know, we need to make sure that our care systems go on, that the care is, is, is provided. We need to make sure that our health systems go on. You know, how should, we, how should this be done, really? And what are the different ways of doing it? And what's currently the contribution of, of unpaid labor, and shouldn't we change that? And um, so I think I think those are really valuable and interesting dis discussions to be had. And I think thinking about resilience, systemic resilience, forces us to have those discussions now. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, and I wanted to turn to Liam. Liam, um, when it comes to the economic recovery, business growth will be a really key. Um, element to look out for, and what are the tools that might stimulate migrant entrepreneurship in this context? Thank you. So, first of all, I would like to apologize if during my intervention the camera was shaking a bit. I think I forget that body language is a bit lost during the virtual era. Um, yeah, excellent question on entrepreneurship. I mean, that's also um, an area that we uh, that we explored as. Uh, 
as a you know as an area of um, potential investment to rebuild livelihoods in the aftermath of crisis and uh, i think there are you know pros and cons definitely um there is to be said that uh, as we have observed in many countries i uh, saw some data from germany um, I mean, uh, business obviously throughout Europe and the world has um, suffered uh, very heavily, especially small companies, SMEs, um, have suffered, have, have really taken a toll from this crisis, and this in many cases has affected particularly heavily migrant entrepreneurs, um, often because they are very small micro businesses, um, because maybe also they uh, face greater barriers in accessing information. Um, about available uh, measures that governments, uh, you know, have created um, uh, now in the uh, in the post pandemic or during the pandemic crisis, or they uh, are not eligible, or they they face other barriers in in accessing uh, these benefits. However, of course, in a in a context, you could argue that in a context of market disruption, which will um, you know really um, yeah disrupt change the status quo and. Uh, um, kind of like um, create problems for many incumbents in certain sectors, there could be some openings for uh, for new business, uh, not only for migrants, for everyone, but of course that would be worth then considering as many programs already do um, of, of employment support, of active labor market policies, whether you should uh, even more strongly incorporate entrepreneurial skills into uh, curricula um, and this is yeah both for generic um, public support curricula, but in particular then for um, you know um, integration uh, related measures. Uh, as I mentioned previously in my uh, in my intervention, this is uh, yeah not only a factor for business creation, but potentially also just to help vulnerable groups uh, find their way in labor markets that are more and more uncertain and, and volatile. So. These sort of like entrepreneurial skills of uh, you know making strategic decisions, seeing where uh, the payoff may be uh, greater, and which skills to invest in in advance to to reach a certain outcome uh, may be important, uh, independently of uh, you know formal actual business creation. So I'll just stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Liam. Um, and Natalia, you talked a little bit about the risks of social isolation, but also the opportunities of, of remote learning at this moment. But once the pandemic is over, what initiatives will really work to reduce social isolation, help build social ties, and help women who perhaps are not equipped for a fast track program still meaningfully contribute to their societies? Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes we think about getting the task of getting vulnerable populations into work as an all or nothing. Um, you know, either you're in a productive form of employment or you're dependent on social benefits, but there might be partial measures. Um, and so I think one thing that we've looked at to reduce social isolation um, for for women migrants and refugees in particular might be getting them into work adjacent activities. Um, so things like social enterprises that are focused on um, cooking or ethnic catering services, sewing, gardening, um, these things can sometimes provide a stepping stone into formal labor markets, um, but we can also think of them as economic empowerment programs. So even if they never translate into formal work, um, they provide a, a, a touch point to um, building hard skills outside the classroom um, and also providing financial independence for women, especially for women with low literacy who might really struggle to, you know, attend formal training or courses. Um, and of course, at the same time, it's, it's building networks, it's building bridges um, with the host community and among other migrants. So I think sometimes it might be worth thinking more creatively about what problems we're really trying to solve, what what we value and what we want to invest in, um, and if we can get there with, with some smaller steps. Thank you, Natalia. Um, uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, so apologies to anyone whose questions we didn't get to. Um, the audio and video from today's event will be available on Thursday. 
Um, and you can also find lots of materials um, online about MPI's work on, on COVID. Um, I wanted to end with three, three policy challenges or kind of a roadmap, a to-do list, let's call it a to-do list. Um, the first is um, making the case for investments in human capital when we're likely to face um, stiff competition for scarce resources. The second is, uh, and I think both Natalia and Martin have touched on this, understanding the social value of different types of activity that don't look like traditional work. Um, and then the third is working across government to address complex challenges. Um, we at MPI have been talking forever about the need for a whole of government approach to integration, but I think the pandemic almost flips it. Integration policymakers have a lot to offer their colleagues who are grappling with um, pandemic related challenges, whether it's the difficulties that young people have accessing the labor market and older people, as Dimitri talked about, whether it's people who um, lose their jobs because of more rapid uh, automation and digitization that we're seeing um, the pandemic act as a catalyst for. Um, integration policymakers have a lot of knowledge on what works in skills training, how you retrain the different sectors. And I think that um, it's more important than ever to be having these conversations across the whole of government. Um, there's some final notes on your screen, um, um, some um, reports to look at, and reporters can contact Michelle at mlittlestat at migrationpolicy.org. Uh, you can sign up for MPI updates. Um, and most of all, I just want to thank um, our speakers for some really terrific comments um, and the audience has some great comments and questions as well. So thank you all. Goodbye.